a tempest in me. You what? Elf workers taking your trades. They took our jobs. Yeah, yeah they're down. They took they're our sure job. They oh man, this episode was way too memeable. So just like I did with episode 1, 2, and 3, for episode 4, uh, for the beginning of this video, I'll essentially just give my overview and my initial thoughts about the show in general and this episode specifically, and then we'll get into each specific plot point that gets into more of each of the characters in the story arcs. Spoilers! nothing happens. Anyway, let me give a quick shout out and thank you to everyone for subscribing and liking this video and all the other videos that I do. I love doing this stuff for y'all and it is really cool for me to see and watch this channel grow. So once again, thank you for your subscription and your like. All right, so episode four is very slow and tiresome. For me specifically, this was probably the slowest and most difficult to get through of the four that we've seen so far. And we are halfway through the series at this point, and I still feel like I can't really identify or resonate or root for any one of these characters. And I think that's why I feel like it's so slow. Now, granted, there are a few that I feel like I can resonate with a little bit more or that I have uh, more interest in, and that is Durin and Elendil. Both of them um, are very well versed in their craft of acting, I feel like. And uh, plus, the, the dwarves just seem much more intriguing to me. Their storyline and their arc seems very interesting. And of course, Elendil, because he is a master at his craft in acting. And so uh, whenever he's on the, the screen, he just commands that presence, which I love. But it definitely feels like with this series that each episode feels like it gets like more drawn out and exhausting to watch with each week that goes by. And it's also pretty pathetic and kind of discouraging that the one character that Amazon is trying to get us to like other than Galadriel is Halbrand. And yet we have seen multiple signs that Halbrand is going to be Sauron by the end of the series. It's going to be this big bait and switch, subversion of expectations. It's going to be the same thing that Star Wars did with Luke Skywalker. And this is where one of my big complaints is at because they have identified Halbrand as a specific look, a specific character, a specific heritage to match that of Aragorn from the original trilogy and that to me is like sacrilege. I hate the fact that they are making Halbrand into this great value brand Aragorn and expecting us to root for him only to have our sub our expectations subverted whoa, to then make him Sauron. Like oh the hero that you guys thought he was he's actually the villain and has been this whole time. And that to me like I said is really discouraging pretty pathetic and it just takes the winds out of my sails every time I see him on screen. But of course, this was intentional by Amazon to make him look like that. He obviously has the characteristics of more of a masculine heroic figure. He has the characteristics of Aragorn. He has the long brown hair, kind of the brown, darker scruff of facial hair, and is the heir, heir to the uh, Southlands or to what will later be Mordor. And so he's kind of, he has all these characteristics that match that of the Aragorn that we see from the original trilogy and that's what's like I said so frustrating because I know that what their intentions are they're trying to make us think that he's our next Aragorn and then they're going to flip it on us and go actually you were wrong for liking this heroic masculine character because he's actually the evil one the other really infuriating thing about this show that you see like it is blatant in this episode specifically but it is constantly like the showrunners are constantly thinking of things that they want to put in the show and then De like designing a plot line around that. So instead of creating a story and allowing characters to have moments within that story that you can enjoy and moments that you can uh, pull from, like we see the showrunners putting things in, like for example, in this episode, a Rondir shooting arrows in slow motion against the orcs as he protects Theo, which is the little boy in the show. And in the context of the plot and in the story of the show, it makes 
no sense whatsoever. Absolute nonsense for him to be there at that moment, you know, firing arrows at the orcs, trying to protect Theo, meeting the the girl Bronwyn in the forest in the middle of the woods. Like none of it just makes none of it makes sense. And yet I know that the reason why they wanted that is because the showrunners in the writing room were like, hey, I want to do this with Arondir, or hey, I want to do this with Galadriel. And they write their plot points around that, and they write the script around these little moments that they want to happen. And that does a disservice to everyone. All the characters, all the storylines, all the plot contrivances, everything fails because of the fact that they want to insert whatever it is that they like or like their little scene that they want to show and pat themselves on the back with all for the all for the sake of deteriorating the plot and the story i will say however that my favorite part in this episode always in casa doom i think most people who watch this show are going to be uh very taken back by the the just the the grandeur of Casa Doom and the characters that are there. Uh, I'm very compelled by uh, Durin and his father. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that Durin and his father actually have a really intimate moment and scene in this show, and I really felt for them in that moment. However, I know that it has nothing to do with the actual story or character progression, and so that's why it was just a fleeting moment in time that. I wasn't really able to enjoy as much as I wanted to because I know that this isn't going to further the story in any way. Uh, but I loved that moment. I really think that if we had more of those uh, moments, whether it's in the actual writing or whether it's with those dwarves specifically in Casa Doom, uh, I think I would really enjoy this show much more. So with all that being said, let's get right into this. This episode had a lot of cutting back and forth between different characters and different locations. It's very chaotic in how it goes between all the different storylines and plots. So because of that, I'm just going to break this down into kind of like Numenor's story as a whole with Muriel, Ferrazon, uh, Elendil, Galadriel, that whole thing. And then I'll break it up into the second one, which will be Arondir and Bronwyn and the kid Theo. And then I'll break it into the last story Story, which is going to be Elrond and Durin and Khazad Doom and everything in that. We open the episode with Muriel blessing children of Numenor when all of a sudden a large wave comes and sweeps over the entirety of the island and the city, crushing everything as it crushes her too. And then we see that she wakes up from a nightmare and we are brought into the town square, which within minutes of this episode opening, we are given Guess what? More allegory, because we all know that Tolkien loved allegory, right? That is sarcasm, by the way. Uh, no, Tolkien hated allegory, and this is one of the most allegorical things within the show, especially this episode. We have one of the men of Numenor saying that the elves are at their doorstep, they're at their uh, docks, and that they're going to be taking their lands and taking their jobs, which is why I put the South Park episode, because it's it's parody at this point of how ridiculous the allegory is and subcontext of the show is and uh he's rallying these people up and getting everyone in this big you know uh kind of town square area to where Farazon finds them and he says my friends trust me because I will not let your jobs or your livelihood fall into the hands of an elf. I will keep this man's world in, in Numenor. And they all raise a drink and he says, the drinks are on me and then everyone's happy again. So this is something that we're going to see early on within Numenor is this divide and this split between the Kingsmen and the faithful. The Kingsmen being those who will later start to sacrifice people to Morgoth. They are going to want uh, power. They are going to be corrupted. Uh, now now, however, the faithful are those faithful to Iluvatar, to the elves, um, to the Valar, uh, and those are people like Elendil, who we'll see later, uh, who will be part of that faithful. I don't know who this guy is, what his character's name is, or why he's even in the show, so I'm not even going to talk about it. It's literally a 30 second scene and you guys don't really need to know much about it. I also love how if you check the crowd that is like in the town square that's all chanting, elf lover, elf lover lover, elf lover that's talking about the queen, most of them, not all, but most are white men. So like, hey, 
Great job, Amazon. Just congratulations on being so on the nose. We then cut to Muriel and Galadriel speaking about what Galadriel's intentions are, which is basically that she wants the backing and support from Numenor to go to the Southlands so that she can fight off Sauron and the orcs. Um, and this is a very similar conversation to what we hear in the Fellowship of the Ring with Elrond and Gandalf, when Gandalf is saying, you know, what about the allegiances of elves and men? You know, we, we need that back. And it, they say that almost verbatim here, except for, for Galadriel, I believe, says, what happened to the alliance between Numenor and elves or something like that. So again, they're trying to throw in the member berries from the Lord of the Rings original series or original uh, trilogy. And it's just, it's not working. It just makes me more upset because I'm like, Y'all aren't making this more fun for me, or it's not, like, I'm not that type of viewer where I'm enjoying the fact that you're just completely disregarding Tolkien's works and pulling from the movies to try and make us happy and clap like a bunch of seals at what you're trying to do. But Muriel says no and passes on this request by Galadriel, to which Galadriel gets extremely angry and calls her out and says that she needs to talk to the true king, the one that she knows is in the tower, that is sick and that uh, Muriel has been talking to. And at this point, Muriel gets upset and throws Galadriel in jail. But before that, we this is where we get the quintessential there is a tempest in me scene because she's basically saying there is a storm brewing in me. There is a fire in me that wants to go to the Southlands and hunt these orcs. And you, Queen Muriel, are not going to stop me from doing that. That is essentially what Galadriel says in this episode, to which Muriel does not take kindly to. So they throw her in prison, and we go to our next scene. Isildur is seen on the ship that he is being uh, tested on, and he hears the whisper of Isildur from the west into the western lands. Uh, he hears that call again, to which he determines that by letting go of the rope on the ship, it will release the sail and and it will have, make him fail the class. Uh, but by doing so, he actually gets two of his friends in trouble. So the captain of the ship not only expels Isildur from this ship crew, but he also expels the two friends who did nothing wrong. They were actually trying to fix Isildur's mistake. And Isildur says, I did it on purpose. I wanted to fail. Don't fire them or don't take them off the, the schooling. And this captain just says, nah, fuck off. I'm getting rid of all three of you. And it, you can so obviously tell that it is the showrunners just trying to come up with ways to create conflict when it makes no logical sense for the captain to lose more men on his ship, to expel more men that are willing and able to be on that ship just because of Isildur's stupid mistake. Well, I guess I shouldn't say mistake because it was Isildur's like failure that he purposefully wanted to do instead of just deferring to another year or instead of just going to the captain and saying this isn't something I want so I'm going to resign from this ship crew. So this happens really quickly and we just go right back to Galadriel in her cell where she is pacing and she's speaking with Halbrand about the conversation that they just recently had with Mario. So Halbrand says this line where he says the queen's court is not your normal battlefield is it? When in all actuality, yes, it absolutely should be for Galadriel. But they're trying to make her this like Conan barbarian monster, like Galadriel woman who's just this conqueror who never speaks to any king or queen in their lair. Like, no, no, no. If Galadriel were truly an elf of Linden or whatnot, or, you know, part of the Valar, like she would understand the nuances of speaking with kings and queens. You can't just blatantly, outrageously, ragefully talk to people in a demeaning and condescending manner, thinking that you're just gonna get everything that you want. And I don't buy this whole thing of like, well, Galadriel is just young. At this point in time, which granted the showrunners don't even know what time frame we're in, we're in but at this point in time, she would be maybe like a thousand, maybe 2000 years old. So in elf terms, 
She's young, but not young enough to be stupid enough to talk to a queen in a manner that is going to be so condescending and arrogant that will get her put in prison. So this line, the queen's court isn't your normal battlefield, is just total bullshit in my opinion by Halbrand. And it makes the showrunners look extremely dumb that they don't understand Galadriel and just don't understand characters in general that would have to speak to people in a tactful manner if trying to ask for something. Farazhan then brings in five Five armored guards to take Galadriel out of her cell and bring her to a ship where she is going to be sent back to her elf family and Galadriel gets opened out of the cell and pushes all five of them like beats one up and then the other two fall in with him and then she just pushes the other two in it, I, the editing in this scene is absolutely wild because you don't know how they all just got into this prison I wanted to like flip my table it's so ridiculous how she does this it's almost worse than the snow troll uh, it happens in like two seconds and then all of a sudden they're just locked in this cell but we do get something from Halbrand where we see him whispering into Farazan's ear saying you might not want to pull that sword out of your sheath we see this because we're constantly getting more hints that Halbrand is going to be revealed as Sauron later because if you guys know Sauron was actually the deceiver of Farazhan in Numenor so if the showrunners are going to play by that logic this is kind of a hint and a nudge towards that direction. So now that Galadriel's out of her prison cell she just scales the entire tower <laughs> she pulls some crazy Assassin's Creed shit on us and scales the entire tower to go find Muriel and the king and her the the Muriel's father and to which they start to begin to talk within this like a trophy room of like all these different swords and shields and armor and helmets and that's where they find the Palantir and the two of them discuss more about the allegiance and the alliance between Numenor and elves and to which Muriel continues to say no I'm sorry I will not give you my armies I will not lend you my aid uh, this is something that you're just gonna have to do on your own so they have a going away for her they send her off on a boat but then as they are sending her her off, uh, Elendil and Muriel and Farazhan all begin to see the leaves of the white tree in Numenor begin to fall to which we are reminded of the, the line in the Fellowship um, or I think in Two Towers where Aragorn says, not idly do the leaves of Lorien fall, meaning that the Valar uh, are kind of watching over the Numenorians um, and that their tears are somewhat of these, these leaves that are falling. It's kind of like a... Uh, somewhat of a sign to Numenor that something is about to happen. So instead of sending Galadriel on her way, Muriel brings her back and asks her Numenorians who wants to join them in the Great Crusade against the Southlands, which to me doesn't make much sense because if you have a Numenorian army and navy, which we have clearly seen both of, why are you asking regular people if they are going to try and fight off an entire invasion of orcs that doesn't make it, it would be like if Newsom went into Los Angeles and said I need every able-bodied man and woman to uh, man and woman to to help me in my quest against you know New York or something no one would raise their hands in LA I'm sorry but that's just not gonna happen they're all they have jobs they have families but like why not utilize your military that you already have in Numenor so we end that chapter with people raising their hands and everyone being called to the Southlands under the Numenor banner and will fight alongside Galadriel and Muriel. Then we get to Arondir and the Southlands and everything that is entwined with that. Um, now there is an interesting moment where we meet Adar, who is the one that we saw that was kind of blurred and fuzzy in the last episode, but he is kind of the leader of these pale orcs. But Adar is an elf who is scarred on one side of his face. We don't know his backstory. We don't know his history. I do think that Adar is an interesting character. I just don't know what role he's going to play in the grand scheme of things. But uh, we see him and we see Arondir. And of course, we see all the pale orcs, the white orcs. There's no uh, allegory here or subtext here. Is there, Amazon? They specifically went out of their way to make all of these orcs not only pale, 
but all of their garb, all of their gear, all of the skin that they wear, and the helmets, and the bone, and even their weapons are all white. Like, guys, please, get over yourselves. Get over this hashtag no more white comfort bullshit. Like, this is allegory to the nth degree, and we can see it with you chaining up a rondier with the white, you know, orcs standing above him. It's getting really old at this point. But Adar basically talks to a rondier and says that he has a message for a rondier to send to the town of the people in the Southlands. And he says that basically if they do not leave, that he will kill them all. But as long as they leave, they must swear their fealty to Adar. And so he sends Arondir on his way to present this message to the uh, villagers. And then we go to Bronwyn's people and the townsfolk that have started to make their way from the town into the elves tower, which has been abandoned by this point. But we find out that the townspeople forgot their fucking food. They didn't bring any food on their travels. They didn't bring any food to the tower which they are going to be living in at this point. They left their homeland and brought nothing of provisional power. Like, they literally just up and left with the clothes on their back and that was it. But in the last, in like episode two, we saw them with carts and like sacks and backpacks and like, you know, stuff like, so we're, and, and then we find out later in the episode that food is still at the village. It's not like they ran out of food. It's that they just didn't bring it. <laughs> that is the stupidest plot line or the story where the story just doesn't make sense whatsoever. I can't even put it to words how badly that is written. The fact that villagers who are leaving their home that are so scared of, of a presence of potentially an evil power would forget their own food, something that they have to live on in order to continue to travel or live in peace with, and yet they didn't bring a single, a single thing of rice. Didn't even bring that. So because the townspeople forgot their food within the town, Theo recommends that he and his friend go back to uh, grab some of the provisions to bring it back to the tower that everyone is staying in right now. So when Theo goes back, he actually finds an orc and they get into kind of a fight. So Theo has to hide in a well. And then the orcs begin to try and search for him because he has the blade. And uh, I guess it's a Morgul blade. We're not sure yet, but it is the blade that he has been carrying for this past three episodes or so and the orcs are looking for that specifically so they're hunting down Theo and let me just say Theo is a chore to watch he's not compelling he's not the greatest actor he isn't given any great dialogue and so it is extre it is a chore like I said to get through his scenes but then uh, at night, he tries to get out of the well that he's been hiding in from the orcs. He leaves the well, starts to run away, and then one of the orcs catches him. And before the orc can kill him, guess who it is? Great value brand Legolas, a Rondir comes to save the day. He kills the orc and he tells uh, Theo, come, come with me if you want to live. And they start running through the forest, which is where we get the slow-mo battle scene of a Rondir fighting all the pale orcs. And he's flinging his arrows and fighting with his sword. And uh, Theo's trying to run away. And then Bronwyn somehow finds them in the forest and, like, goes to help. A lot of this show is just, like, something happens and then you just so... And then, and then you just say, because? Or, like, this thing just kind of happens there's no real reason to anything things just kind of happen and you're just left to believe okay so we end that storyline that plot point and those characters by uh Arondir, theo and bronwyn leaving the forest and being out in the sunlight to where these like vampire orcs <laughs> like can we talk about the fact that they're vamp they're like vampirical like they, they can't be in the sun <laughs> what, what what is happening what in God's name is happening? Okay. The orcs can't go into the sun, so they don't chase after Arondir, Theo, and Bronwyn. So the three of them get away, and the other orcs have to stay under the trees that are providing them protection from the sun. Just go with it. I don't know anymore. And that brings us to our third and last, like, kind of final plot point and characters, which is probably my favorite out of this whole episode, which is 
Elrond, Durin, and Deza. Um, Elrond, we find him in Linden, and they're actually creating the forge. So I don't know how long, like, they're really compressing the timeline here because we just completely missed an entire episode worth of, like, dialogue and conversation about the dwarves and the elves coming together to build this forge in Linden. Because, like, it's halfway built already in this episode, and we're just left to believe, like, okay, that, that just happened in three days, in, like, a day. So, I don't know, whatever. It looks good. I mean, the CGI is cool. I don't know. But most people will clap like seals at that and, and enjoy that. But, I, I mean, for me, it doesn't make sense with the timeline. Anyway, Elrond goes to Casa Doom where he sees uh, Diza and Durin speaking about the old mine. And we actually get to kind of see something cool here where we see a little bit of Elrond's elf eyes where he's able to zoom in and actually read their lips and hear what they're saying uh, from farther away. He's able to kind of understand what their conversation is. And we do see that Durin is keeping secrets from him because of what is in the old mine, which we find out later, to actually be Mithril. But I had a problem with how Elrond finds the Mithril, because earlier on when they are with Diza, the children are singing this like ring around the rosy type of song, but they're saying something about the Mithril or saying something about the caves, and Elrond is able to recall that and memorize that and so when he's looking for the the entrance into the old mine which is where they find the mithril he's like looking for something and then he remembers the song from the children and he sings the song and pounds on the on the wall and sure enough the doors open like what what kind of plot contrivance is that like that is so convenient that is so lucky that would be like i don't have kids but if i had kids that would be like them singing my pin number to someone and then someone just being like oh the pin number that's right and then taking all my money or something like <laughs> I, I why are the kids singing the song to get into the mine that obviously is secretive that only Durin and like four other dwarves are allowed into because of this secret ore that they have found called Mithril. Anyway, Elrond goes into the mine and finds Durin, to which Durin is extremely upset and he says, you broke my trust, how could you do all this, blah blah blah, and, you know, you're only in it for finding out what I'm trying to do here. So Durin finally says, okay, you have to swear an oath to me in order for me to tell you what it is that we are mining and what we have found. So Durin and Elrond on both swear an oath to which Durin then, show, then shows him the Mithril that they have found. This is a big plot point for the dwarves considering that Mithril is one of the uh, lightest weight minerals. It's one of the hardest and, and strongest uh, pieces of ore that they can find that can be made into jewelry or armor. Uh, it's what we see Frodo wearing in the original trilogy. Like Mithril changes the game for all of Middle Earth really. And so Durin is very particular about how he's mentioning this and being very secretive about that with Elrond. But then after they speak about Mithril, there is a large uh, rock pile and collapse within the mine. And and so Durin goes to run after because there are uh, multiple dwarves within that mine that he wants to go save. Uh, they end up saving all the dwarves and, and everyone's fine. We don't get to actually see that though, which is unfortunate. But because of this happening, Durin then has to go tell his father, King Durin, that this has happened and that the, uh, the, the, the mines are starting to collapse here, even though it was initially a secret. Um, but this is where we get, like I said, my one of my favorite scenes in the entire episode, which is King Durin and Durin the Fourth having this kind of father-son moment. Um, it was really, really touching, and uh, both actors are, like I said earlier, masters at their craft, and I really enjoyed the interaction between the two. I really like the depiction of Durin's throne room here. I think it looks fantastic. Um, whoever did the set design here, bravo. A lot of the costume and makeup uh, looks fantastic in this scene as well, so I'll end with that on a positive note. I will also mention that when the rock begin to fall when there's that big rumble in the deep when there is that big growl that happens that you know allows the rocks to fall and, and Durin gets all upset and and has to go save those dwarves I did hear a growl I did hear a big thunderous kind of roar and we are told maybe potentially in the scene that there could be Durin's Bane 
at the end of season one, which is of course the Balrog. We saw it in some of the trailers and some of the previews. Uh, so if that is the case, we may end up seeing a Balrog by the end of season one. Well, there you have it, guys. That is episode four. Thank you so much for watching. Like I said, if you guys enjoy these reviews, please like it, share with other people, and comment what your favorite part was or what you've been enjoying about these reviews or about the show in general. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video.